Hey, Bella. Sorry, I missed the end of the countdown. My bad. A little scattered at the moment. Realized as I sat down that I hadn't even picked a book. So, I had to get title cards ready and all that real quick. You can't hear me now, right? I didn't mess that up. Hey, little dude. Everybody can hear me? Yes? No? Maybe? Does eight ball still work? Right, I didn't update the subscription. I'm not sure eight ball's worth it. What do you guys think? Is eight ball worth like 20 US dollars a month? I don't think we use it enough to justify that. Could be wrong. Not worth it. Okay. Initially, I thought it was supposed to help with multi-stream. It did also give me a couple of uh, cool transitions and stuff. This may be worth it as like a one-time, but paid for like six months of that. You'd think they'd let me keep eight ball. Not fair. Not fair at all. Oh, I suppose I ought to throw out a couple of promo posts real fast. That's stop it, Discord. Discord was trying to be helpful. Helpful is not helpful. Why don't they understand that? Do not throw up a whole bunch of prompts that I can't close out of that interfere with me doing what I need to do in a rapid fashion. Don't like it. Do not like. Uh, let's see. Sorry about the short stream earlier this week. If you, uh, guys listen to it I think it should be fairly apparent fairly obvious as it were what was going on it's a really good excuse I think only get to use it once in your life yeah I'm still I got the feels man all the feels, lots of feels. Dude is never going to apologize for the shit he did. Because, you know, he can't now. No, I'm here. I'm here. I've been talking to my sister more than I have in the last couple of years. And one of my brothers. It's funny, we had a cousin post on social media about how devastated he was. And, you know, that such a great guy, and a great uncle, and a great father. want to like let my cousin have it because that is that is not who that man was at all well I don't know what do you guys think
So believe it or not, I've never read Don Quixote, which is why I picked it. Because my other ones I was looking at were uh, Three Musketeers and Gulliver's Travels. And I've read both of those. As those of you who have been watching for a while know, I, I try to read books that I haven't ever read before, which is more challenging than you might think it is. So I've read quite a few books in my life. couple more promo posts and we'll get going. A few copies of Don Quixote? Uh, one or two and I've read none of them. That's, that's kind of bad actually, isn't it? Now I feel bad. All the feels. Feels bad, man. <sighs> All right. Well, got my tea i've got all of you promo promo poster done so who knows maybe we'll get a couple more people popping in joining us for story time i have a century plus old copy of don quixote with over 700 illustrations it says Oh yeah, all the woodcut illustrations. Some of these look really cool. Maybe I shall post some of these in the Discord. Hmm. Apparently somebody tried to press a leaf once upon a time with this one. All it seemed to have done was stay in the book, unfortunately. And why couldn't they have done that with, I don't know, a dictionary? Right? Is going to be a long one, though. Yes, I did have this book for the uh, for the banner. Well, actually, let's see how old my other copy is. Don't get this. When was this one published? Ah, this one is. <laughs> I can't read this one. This translation was published in 1946, so it's under copyright. over a century and we're good to go and I even did I think I did I did a new title card for it no you didn't make me feel bad at all Bella not even a little bit Thank you. 
skip ahead a little bit past the preface and the other things. All right, here we go. Hey, Sparky, glad you could make it. Adventures of Don Quixote, Book One, Chapter One, which treats of the quality and pursuits of the famous Don Quixote de la Mancha. Down in a village of La Mancha, the name of which I have no desire to recollect, there lived, not long ago, one of those gentlemen who usually keep a lance upon a rack, an old buckler, a lean horse, and a coursing greyhound. Soup, composed of somewhat more mutton than beef, the fragments served up cold on most nights, lentils on Fridays, pains and breakings on Saturdays, and a pigeon, by way of addition, on Sundays, consumed three-fourths of his income. The remainder of it supplied him with a cloak of fine cloth, velvet breeches with slippers of the same for holidays, and a suit of the best homespun, in which he adorned himself on weekdays. His family consisted of a housekeeper above forty, a niece not quite twenty, and a lad who served him both in the field and at home, who could saddle the horse or handle the pruning hook. The age of our gentleman bordered on fifty years. He was of a strong constitution, spare-bodied, of a meager visage, an early riser and a lover of the chase. Some pretend to say that his surname was Quixada or Quesada, for on this point his historians differ, though, from very probable conjectures, we may conclude that his name was Quixana. This, however, is of little import to our history. Let it suffice that, in relating it, we do not swerve a jot from the truth. Be it known, then, that the aforementioned gentleman, in his leisure moments, which composed the greater part of the year, gave himself up with so much ardor to the perusal of books of chivalry that he almost wholly neglected the exercise of the chase, and even the regulation of his domestic affairs. Indeed, so extravagant was his zeal in this pursuit that he sold many acres of arable land to purchase books of knight errantry, collecting as many as he could possibly obtain. Among them all, none pleased him so much as those written by the famous Feliciano de, Sil de Silva, whose brilliant prose and intricate style were, in his opinion, infinitely precious, especially those amorous speeches and challenges in which they so abound, such as, the reason of the unreasonable treatment of my reason so enfeebles my reason that with reason I complain of your beauty. And again, the high heavens that, with your divinity, divinely fortify you with the stars, rendering your meritorious of the merit merited by your greatness. These and similar rhapsodies distracted the poor gentleman, for he labored to comprehend and unravel their meaning which is more than Aristotle himself could do, were he to rise from the dead expressly for that purpose. He was not quite satisfied as to the wounds which Don Belianus gave and received, for he could not help thinking that, however skillful the surgeons were who healed them, his face and whole body must have been covered with seams and scars. Nevertheless, he commended his author for concluding his book with the promise of that interminable adventure, and he often felt an inclination to seize the pen himself and conclude it, literally, as it is there promised. This he would doubtless have done, and with success, had he not been diverted from it by meditations of greater moment, on which his mind was incessantly employed. He often, with the curate of the village, a man of learning and a graduate of Sigenza, which of the two was the best knight, Paul Moran of England, or Amadis de Gaulle, but Master Nicholas, barber of the same place, declared that none ever came up to that knight of the sun, if indeed anyone could be compared to him. It was Don Gal... What was that saying? Don Galore, brother of Amadis de Gaulle, for he had a genius suited to everything. He was no effeminate knight, no whimperer like his brother, and in point of courage he was by no means his inferior. In short, he became so infatuated with this kind of study that he passed whole days and nights over these books. And thus, with little sleeping and much reading, his brains were dried up and his intellects deranged. His imagination was full of all that he had read, of enchantments, contests, battles, challenges, wounds, courtships, amours, tortures, and impossible absurdities. 
and so firmly was he persuaded of the truth of the whole tissue of visionary fiction that, in his mind, no history in the world was more authentic. The Cid Ru Ru Diaz, he asserted, was a very good knight, but not to be compared with the knight of the flaming sword, who with a single backstroke cleft asunder to fierce and monstrous giants. He was better pleased with Bernardo de Ca del Carpio, because, at Runcivals, he slew Roland the Enchanted by availing himself of the stratagem employed by Hercules upon Antaeus, whom he squeezed to death with his arms. He spoke very favorably of the giant Morganti, for although that monstrous brood were always proud and insolent, he alone was courteous and well-bred. Above all, he admired Rinaldo de Maltavon, particularly when he saw him sallying forth from his castle to plunder all he encountered. And when, moreover, he seized upon that image of Mahomet, which, according to history, was of massive gold. But he would have given his housekeeper and even his niece into the bargain for a fair opportunity of kicking the traitor Gelalon. In fine, his judgment became completely obscured. He was seized with one of the strangest fancies that ever entered the head of any madman. This was a belief that it behooved him, as well for the advancement of his glory, as the service of his country, to become a knight-errant, and traverse the world, armed and mounted, in quest of adventures, and to practice all that had been performed by knights-errant, of whom he had read, redressing every species of grievance, and exposing himself to dangers which, being surmounted, might secure to him eternal glory and renown. The poor gentleman imagined himself at least crowned Emperor of Trebizon by the valor of his arm, and thus wrapped in these agreeable delusions, and borne away by the extraordinary pleasure he found in them, he hastened to put his designs into execution. The first thing he did was scour up some rusty armor which had been his great-grandfather's, and had lain many years neglected in a corner. This he cleaned and adjusted as well as he could, but he found one grand defect. The helmet was incomplete, having only the morion. This deficiency, however, he ingeniously supplied by making a kind of visor of pasteboard, which being fixed to the morion, gave the appearance of an entire helmet. It is true indeed that, in order to prove its strength, he drew his sword and gave it two strokes, the first of which instantly demolished the labor of a week, but not altogether approving of the facility which with it was destroyed, and in order to secure himself against a similar misfortune, he made another visor, which having fenced in the inside with small bars of iron, he felt assured of its strength, and without making any more experiments, held it to be a most excellent helmet. In the next place he visited his steed, and although this, this animal had this animal had more blemishes than the horse of Gonella, which tantrum pellis et osifut, yet in his eyes neither Bus the Bucephalus of Alexander nor Sid's Babic Babica, sorry, I'm stumbling over some of these, could be compared with him. Four days was he deliberating upon what name he should give him, for as he said to himself, it would be very improper that a horse so excellent appertaining to a knight so famous should be without an appropriate name. He therefore endeavored to find one that should express what he had been before he belonged to a knight, errant, and also what he now was. Nothing could indeed be more reasonable than that. When the master changed his state, the horse should likewise change his name and assume one, pompous and high-sounding, as became the new order he now professed. So after having devised, altered, lengthened, curtailed, rejected, and again framed in his imagination a variety of names, he finally determined upon Rosinante, a name, in his opinion, lofty and sonorous and full of meaning, importing that he had only, <clears throat> that he had been only a Rosin, a drudge horse, before his present condition, and that now he was before all the Rosins in the world. Having given his horse a name so much to his satisfaction, he resolved to fix upon one for himself. This consideration employed him eight more days, when at length he determined to call himself Don Quixote, when some of the historians of this most true history have concluded that his name was certainly Quixada, and not Quesada, as others would have it. Then, recollecting that the valorous Amadis, not content with the simple appellation of Amadis, added thereto the name of his country, of his kingdom, and native country, in order to render it famous, styling himself Amadis de Gaulle, 
So he, like a good knight, also added the name of his province, and called himself Don Quixote de la Mancha, whereby, in his opinion, he fully proclaimed his lineage and country, which at the same time he honored by taking its name. His armor being now furbished, his helmet made perfect, his horse and himself provided with names. He found nothing wanting but a lady to be in love with, for a knight errant without the tender passion was a tree without leaves and fruit, a body without a soul. If, said he, for my sins, or rather through my good fortune, I encounter some giant, an ordinary occurrence to knight errants, and overthrow him at the first onset, or cleave him in twain, or, in short, vanquish him and force him to surrender, must I not have some lady to whom I may send him as a present, that when he enters into the presence of my charming mistress, he may throw himself upon his knees before her, and in a submissive, humble voice say, Madam, in me you behold the giant Caracusliambro, lord of the island Melan Melan Melandrania, who being vanquished in single combat by the never enough to be praised Don Quixote de la Mancha, and by him commanded to present myself before you, to be disposed of according to the will and pleasure of your highness. How happy was our good knight after this harangue! How much more so when he found a mistress! It is said that, in a neighboring village, a good-looking peasant girl resided, of whom he had formerly been enamored, although it does not appear that she ever knew or cared about it. And this was the lady whom he chose to nominate mistress of his heart. He then sought a name for her, which, without entirely departing from her own, should incline and approach towards that of a princess or great lady, and determined upon Dulcinea del Toboso, for she was a native of that village, a name, he thought, harmonious, uncommon, and expressive, like all the others which he had adopted. Chapter 2 Which treats of the first sally that Don Quixote made from his native village. As soon as these arrangements were made, he no longer deferred the execution of his project, which he hastened from a consideration of what the world suffered by his delay. So many were the grievances he intended to redress, the wrongs to rectify, errors to amend, abuses to reform, and debts to discharge. Therefore, without communicating his intentions to anybody, and wholly unobserved, one morning, before day, being one of the most sultry in the month of July, he armed himself, cap a pie, mounted Rosinante, Rosinante and placed the helmet on his head, braced on his target, took his lance, and through the private gate of his backyard, issued forth into the open plain, in a transport of joy to think he had met with no obstacles to the commencement of his honorable enterprise. But scarce had he found himself on the plain when he was assailed by a recollection so terrible as almost to make him abandon the undertaking, for it just then occurred to him that he was not yet dubbed a knight. Therefore, in conformity to the laws of chivalry, he neither could nor ought to enter the list against any of that order, and, if he had actu been actually dubbed, he should, as a new knight, have worn white armor without any device on his shield until he had gained one by force of arms. These considerations made him resolute whether to proceed, but frenzy prevailing over reason, he determined to get himself made a knight by the first one he should meet, like many others of whom he had read. As to the white armor, he resolved, when he had an opportunity to scour his own so that it should be whiter than ermine. Having now composed his mind, he proceeded, taking whatever road his horse pleased, for therein, he believed, consisted the true spirit of adventure. Our new adventurer, thus pursuing his way, conversed with him, within himself, saying, Who doubts but that in future times, when the true history of my famous achievements is brought to light, the sage who recorded them will, in this manner, Describe my first sally. Scarcely had ruddy Phoebus extended over the face of the wide, this wide and spacious earth the golden filaments of his beautiful hair, and scarcely had the little painted birds with their forked tongues hailed in soft and mellifluous, mellifluous harmony the approach of the rosy harbinger morn, who, leaving the soft couch of her jealous consort, had just disclosed herself to mortals through the gates and balconies of the Mankegan horizon when the renowned knight, Don Quixote de la Mancha, quitting the slothful down, mounted Rosinante, his famous steed, proceeded over the ancient, memorable plain of Montiel, which was indeed the truth. 
O happy era, happy age, he continued, when my glorious deeds shall be revealed to the world. Deeds, worthy of being engraven on brass, sculptured in marble, and recorded by the pencil. And thou, O sage enchanter, whosoever thou mayest be, destined to chronicle this extraordinary history, forget not, I beseech thee, my good Rosinante, the inseparable companion of all my toils. Then again, as if really enamored, he exclaimed, O Dulcinea, my princess, sovereign of this captive heart, greatly do you wrong me by a cruel adherence to your decree, forbidding me to appear on the pre in the presence of your beauty. Dine, O oh lady, to think on this enslaved heart, which for love of you endures so many pangs. In this wild strain he continued, imitating the style of his books as nearly as he could, and proceeding slowly on, while the sun rose with such intense heat that it was enough to dissolve his brains, if any had been left. He traveled almost the whole of that day without incurring, encountering anything worthy of recital, which caused him much vexation, for he was impatient for an opportunity to prove the valor of his powerful arm. Some authors say his first adventure was that of the Straits of Lapis. Others affirm it to have been that of the windmills, but from what I have been able to ascertain of this matter, and have found written in the annals of La Mancha, the fact is that he traveled all that day, and as night approached, both he and his horse were wearied and dying with hunger, and in this state, as he looked around him, in hopes of discovering some castle, or shepherd's cot where he might repose and find refreshment, he descried not far from the road an inn, which to him was a star conducting him to the portals, if not the palace of his redemption. He made all the haste he could, and reached it at nightfall. There chanced to stand at the door two young women, ladies of pleasure, as they are called, on their journey to Seville, in the company of some carriers who rested there that night. Now, as everything that our adventurer saw and conceived was, by his imagination, molded to what he had read, so in his eyes the inn appeared to be a castle, with its four turrets and pinnacles of shining silver, together with its drawbridge, deep moat, and all the appurtenances of which, with which such castles are usually described. When he had advanced within a short distance of it, he checked Rosinante, expecting some dwarf would mount the battlements to announce, by sound of trumpet, the arrival of a knight-errant at the castle. But finding them tardy, and Rosinante impatient for the stable, he approached the inn door, and there saw the two strolling girls, who to him appeared to be beautiful damsels or lovely dames, enjoying themselves before the gate of their castle. It happened that just at this time a swineherd collecting his hogs, I make no apology, for so they are called, from an adjoining stubble, stubble field, blew the horn which assembles them together, and instantly Don Quixote was satisfied, for he imagined it was a dwarf who had given the signal with his arrival. With extraordinary satisfaction, therefore, he went up to the inn, upon which the ladies, being startled at the sight of a man armed in that manner, with lance and buckler, were retreating into the house. But Don Quixote, perceiving their alarm, raised his pasteboard visor, thereby partly discovering his meager, dusty visage, and with gentle demeanor and placid voice, thus addressed them. Fly not, ladies, nor fear any discourtesy, for it would be wholly inconsistent with the order of knighthood which I profess to offer insult to any person, much less to virgins of that exalted rank which your appearance indicates. The girls stared at him, and were endeavoring to find out his face which was almost concealed by the sorry visor. But hearing themselves called virgins, a thing so much out of the way of their profession, they could not forbear laughing, and to such a degree that Don Quixote was displeased, and said to them, Modesty well becomes beauty, and excessive laughter, proceeding from a sight cause, is folly. But I say not this to humble or distress you, for my part is no other than to do you service. This language, so unintelligible to the ladies, added to the uncouth figure of our knight, increased their laughter. Consequently, he grew more indignant and would have proceeded further, but for the timely appearance of the innkeeper, a very corpulent and therefore a very pacific man, who upon seeing so ludicrous an object, armed and with accoutrements so ill-sorted as were the bridle, lance, buckler, and corslet, felt disposed to join the damsels in demonstrations of mirth. But in truth, appear apprending some danger from a form thus strongly fortified, he resolved to behave with civility, 
and therefore said, If, Sir Knight, you are seeking for a lodging, you will here find, excepting a bed, for there are none in this inn, everything in abundance. Don Quixote, perceiving the humility of the governor of the fortress, for such to him appeared the innkeeper, answered, For me, Signor Castellon, Castellano, anything will suffice, since arms are my ornaments, warfare my repose. The host thought he called him Castellano because he took him for a sound Castilian, where, <clears throat> whereas he was an Andalusian of the coast of St. Lucre, as great a thief as Kakua, and not less mischievous than a collegian or a page. And he replied, If so, your worship's beds must be hard rocks, and your sleep continual watching, and that being the case, <clears throat> you may dismount with the certainty of finding here sufficient cause for keeping awake the whole year, much more a single night. So saying, he laid hold of Don Quixote's stirrup, who alighted with much difficulty and pain, for he had fasted the whole of the day. He then desired the host to take a special care of his steed, for it was the finest creature that ever fed. The innkeeper examined him, but thought him not so good by half as his master had represented him. Having led the horse to the stable, he returned to receive the orders of his guest, whom the damsels, being now reconciled to him, were disarming. They had taken off the back and breastplates, but endeavored in vain to disengage the gorget, or to take off the counterfeit beaver, which he had fastened with green ribbons, in such a manner that they could not be untied, and he would upon no account allow them to be cut. Therefore he remained all that night with his helmet on, the strangest and most ridiculous figure imaginable. While these light girls, whom he still conceived to be persons of quality, and ladies of the castle, were disarming him, he said to them with infinite grace, Never before was knight so honored by ladies as Don Quixote after his departure from his native village. Damsels attended upon him, princesses took charge of his steed. O Rosinante, for that, ladies, is the name of my horse, and Don Quixote de la Mancha my own, although it was not my intention to have <coughs> discovered myself until deeds performed in your service should have proclaimed me, but impelled to make so just an application of that ancient romance of Lanzarote to my present situation, I have thus prematurely disclosed my name, yet the time shall come when your ladyships may command, and I obey, when the valor of my arm shall make manifest the desire I have to serve you. The girls, unaccustomed to such rhetorical flourishes, made no reply, but asked whether he would be pleased to eat anything. I shall willingly take some food, answered Don Quixote, for I apprehend it would be of much service to me. That day happened to be Friday, and there was nothing in the house but some fish, of that kind which in Castile is called abadexo, in Andalusia bacallo, and in some parts curidio, and in others truchuela. They asked if his worship would like some truchuela, for they had no other fish to offer him. If there be many troutlings, replied Don Quixote, they will supply the place of one trout, for it is the same to me whether I receive eight single riles or one piece of eight. Moreover, these troutlings may be preferable, as veal is better than beef, and kid superior to goat. Be that as it may, let it come immediately, for the toil and weight of arms cannot be sustained by the body, unless the interior be supplied with aliments. For the benefit of the cool air, they placed the table at the door of the inn, and the landlord produced some of his ill-soaked and worse-cooked bacayo with bread as foul and black as the knight's armor. But it was a spectacle highly risible to see him eat, for his hands being engaged in holding his helmet on and raising the beaver, he could not feed himself. Therefore one of the ladies performed this office for him. But to drink would have been utterly impossible had not the innkeeper bored a reed and placing one end into his mouth at the other poured in the wine, and all this he patiently endured rather than cut the lacings of his helmet. In the meantime, there came to the inn a sow doctor, who, as soon as he arrived, blew his pipe for reeds four or five times, which finally convinced Don Quixote that he was now in some famous castle, where he were, were regaled with music, that the poor jack was trout, the bread of the purest white, and the strolling wenches, ladies of distinction, and the innkeeper, governor of the castle. Consequently, he remained satisfied with his enterprise, and first sally though it troubled him to reflect that he was not yet a knight, feeling persuaded that he could not lawfully engage in any adventure until he had been invested with the order of knighthood. 
mean, maybe it's not all bad to be that deluded. I've had a couple of meals that I wish could have uh, appeared to be fine dining. <laughs> Chapter 3, in which is described the diverting ceremony of knighting Don Quixote. Agitated by this idea, he abruptly finished his scanty supper, called the innkeeper, and shutting himself up with him in the stable, he fell on his knees before him and said, Never will I arise from this place, valorous knight, until your courtesy shall vouchsafe to grant a boon which it is my intention to request, a boon that will rebound to your glory and to the benefit of all mankind. The innkeeper, seeing his guest at his feet and hearing such language, stood confounded, and stared at him without knowing what to do or say. He entreated him to rise, but in vain, until he had promised to grant the boon he requested. I expected no less, senor, from your great magnificence, replied Don Quixote. Know, therefore, that for the boon I have demanded, and which your liberality is conceded, is that, on the morrow, you will confer upon me the honor of knighthood. This night I will watch my arms in the chapel of your castle, in order that in the morning my earnest desire may be fulfilled, and I may with propriety traverse the four quarters of the world in quest of adventures for the relief of the distressed, conformable to the duties of chivalry and of knights errant, who, like myself, are devoted to such pursuits. The host, who, as we have said, was a shrewd fellow, and had already entertained some doubts respecting the wits of his guest, was now confirmed in his suspicions, and to make sport for the knight, determined to follow his humor. He told him, therefore, that his desire was very reasonable, and that such pursuits were natural and suitable to knights so illustrious as he appeared to be, and as his gallant demeanor fully testified, that he had himself in the days of his youth followed that honorable profession, and traveled over various parts of the world in search of adventures, failing not to visit the suburbs of Malaga, the Isles of Riaran, the Compass of Seville, the marketplace of Segovia, the olive field of Valencia and the Rondilla of Granada, the coast of St. Lucre, the fountain of Cordova and the taverns of Toledo, and diverse other parts, where he had exercised the agility of his heels and the dexterity of his hands, committing sundry wrongs, soliciting widows, seducing damsels, cheating youths, in short, making himself known to most of the tribunals in Spain, and that finally he had retired to this castle, where he lived upon his revenue and that of others entertaining therein all knights errant of every quality and degree, solely for the great affection he bore them, and that they might share their fortune with him in return for his good will. He further told him that in his castle there was no chapel <clears throat> wherein he could watch his armor, for it had been pulled down in order to be rebuilt, but that in cases of necessity he knew it might be done wherever he pleased. Therefore he might watch it that night in the court of the castle, and following morning, if it pleased God, the requisite ceremony should be performed, and he should be dubbed so effectually that the world would not be able to produce a more perfect knight. He then inquired if he had any money about him. Don Quixote told him he had none, having never read in their histories that knights errant provided themselves with money. The innkeeper assured him he was mistaken, for admitting that it was not mentioned in their history, the authors deeming it unnecessary to specify so thing, things so obviously requisite as money and clean shirts. Yet was it not, therefore, to be inferred that they had none? But on the contrary, he might consider it an established fact that all knights errant, of whose history so many volumes are filled, carried their purses well provided against accidents, that they were also supplied with shirts and a small casket of ointments to heal the wounds they might receive. For in plains and deserts where they fought and were wounded, no aid was near, unless they had some sage enchanter for their friend, who could give them immediate assistance by conveying in a cloud through the air some damsel a dwarf with a phial of water possessed of such virtue that upon tasting a single drop of it they should instantly become as sound as if they had received no injury. But when the knights of former times were without such a friend, they always took care that their esquires should be provided with money and such necessary articles as lint and solves, and when they had no esquires, which very rarely happened, they carried these things themselves upon the crupper of their horse, in wallets so small as to be scarcely visible, that they might seem to be something of more importance. For, except in such cases, the custom of carrying wallets was not tolerated amongst knights errands. 
He therefore advised, though, as his godson, which he was soon to be, he might command him never henceforth to travel without money and the aforesaid provisions, and he would find them serviceable when he least expected it. Don Quixote promised to follow his advice with punctuality, and an order was now given for performing the watch of the armor in a large yard adjoining the inn. Don Quixote, having collected it together, placed it on a cistern which was close to a well. Then bracing on his target and grasping his lance, with graceful demeanor, he paced to and fro before the pile, beginning his parade as soon as it was dark. Your head spinning? <laughs> Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm picking up a lot of uh, things that actually the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe made reference to. Like the uh, Dwarf Trumpkin, who would blow the horn to announce the uh, arrival of the kings and queens of Narnia when they got to Care Paravel. And... Lucy had a magic salve, a little file of or a little file of uh, water that a single drop would heal all wounds. So I thought that was kind of interesting. All right, where were we? The innkeeper informed all who were in the inn of the frenzy of his guest, the watching of his armor, and of the intended knighting. They were surprised at so singular a kind of madness, and went out to observe him at a distance. They perceived him sometimes quietly pacing along, and sometimes leaning upon his lance, with his eyes fixed upon his armor, for a considerable time. It was now night, but the moon shone with a splendor which might vie even with that whence it was borrowed, so that every motion of our new knight might be distinctly seen. At this time, it happened that one of the carriers wanted to give his mules some water, for which purpose it was necessary to remove Don Quixote's armor from the cistern, who, seeing him advance, exclaimed with a loud voice, O thou, whosoever thou art, rash knight, who approaches the armor of the most valiant adventurer that ever girded sword, beware of what thou dost, and touch it not, unless thou would yield thy life as the forfeit of thy temerity. The carrier heeded not this admonition though better it would have been for him if he had. But, seizing hold of the straps, he threw the armor some distance from him, which Don Quixote perceiving, he raised his eyes to heaven, and addressing his thoughts, apparently, to his lady Dulcinea, said, Assist me, O lady, to avenge this first insult offered to your vassal's breast, nor let your favor and protection fail me in this first perilous encounter. Having uttered these and similar, similar ejaculations, he let slip his target, and raising his lance with both hands, he gave the carrier such a stroke upon the head that he fell to the ground in so grievous a plight that had the stroke been repeated, there would have been no need of a surgeon. This done, he replaced his armor and continued his parade with the same tranquility as before. Soon after, another carrier, not knowing what had passed, for the first yet lay stunned, came out with the same intention of watering his mules, and as he approached to take away the armor from the cistern, Don Quixote, without saying a word or imploring any protection, again let slip his target, raised his lance, and with no less effect than before, smote the head of the second carrier. The noise brought out all the people in the inn, and the landlord among the rest, upon which Don Quixote braced on his target, and laying his hand upon his sword, said, O oh, lady of beauty, strength and vigor of my enfeebled heart, now is the time for thee to turn thy illustrious eyes upon this, thy captive knight, whom so mighty an encounter awaits. This address had, he conceived, animated him with so much courage that were all the carriers in the world to have assailed him, he would not have retreated one step. The comrades of the wounded, upon discovering the situation of their friends, began at a distance to discharge a shower of stones upon Don Quixote, who sheltered himself as well as he could with his target, without daring to quit the cistern, because he would not abandon his armor. The innkeeper called aloud to them, begging they would desist, for he had already told them he was insane, and that, as a madman, he would be acquitted, though he were to kill them all. Don Quixote, in a voice still louder, 
called them infamous traitors and the lord of the castle a cowardly baseborn knight for allowing knights errant to be treated in that manner declaring that had he received the order of knighthood he would have made himself sensible to of his perfidy but as for you ye vile and worthless rabble i utterly despise ye advance come on molest me as far as you're able for quickly shall you receive the reward of your folly and insolence this he uttered with so much spirit and intrepidity that the assailants were struck with terror, which, in addition to the landlord's persuasions, made them cease their attack. He then permitted the wounded to be carried off, and with the same gravity and composure resumed the watch of his armor. The host, not relishing these pranks of his guest, determined to put an end to them before any further mischief ensued by immediately investing him with the luckless order of chivalry. Approaching him, therefore, he disclaimed any concurrence on his part and the insolent conduct of those low people who were, he observed, well chastised for their presumption. He repeated to him that there was no chapel in the castle, nor was it by any means necessary for what remained to be done, that the stroke of knighting consisted in blows on the neck and shoulders, according to the ceremonial of the order, which might be effectually performed in the middle of a field, that the duty of watching his armor he had now completely fulfilled for he had watched more than four hours, though only two were required. All this Don Quixote believed, and said that he was there ready to obey him, requesting at the same time to perform the deed as soon as possible, because, should he be assaulted again when he found himself knighted, he was resolved not to leave one person alive in the castle, excepting those whom, out of respect to him, and his particular request, he might be induced to spare. The con... The constable, thus warned and alarmed, immediately brought forth a book in which he kept his account of the straw and oats he furnished to the carriers, and attended by a boy who carried an end of candle, and the two damsels before mentioned, went toward Don Quixote, whom he commanded to kneel down. He then began reading in his manual as if it were some devout prayer, in the course of which he raised his hand and gave him a good blow on the neck, and after that a handsome stroke over the shoulders with his own sword, still muttering between his teeth as if in prayer. This being done, he commanded one of the ladies to gird on his sword, an office she performed with much alacrity as well as discretion, no small portion of which was necessary to avoid bursting with laughter at every part of the ceremony. But indeed, the prowess they had seen displayed by the new knight kept their mirth within bounds. At girding on the sword, the good lady said, God grant you may be a fortunate knight and successful in battle. Don Quixote inquired her name, that he might thenceforward know to whom he was indebted for the favor received, as it was his intention to bestow upon her some share of the honor he should acquire by the valor of his arm. <laughs> she replied with much humility that her name was Tolosa, and that she was the daughter of a cobbler at Toledo, who lived at the stalls of <clears throat> Sancho Bien Bienaya, and that, wherever she was, she would serve and honor him as her lord. Don Quixote, in reply, requested her, for his sake, to do him the favor henceforth to add to her name the title of Don, and call herself Donna Tolosa, which she promised to do. The other girl now buckled on his spur, and with her he held nearly the same conference as with the Lady of the Sword. Having inquired her name, she told him it was Molinera, and that she was daughter to an honest miller at Antiquera, he then requested her likewise to assume the dawn and style herself Donna Molinera, renewing his proffers of service and thanks. These never till then seen ceremonies being thus speedily performed, Don Quixote was impatient to find himself on horseback in quest of adventures. He therefore instantly saddled Rosinante, mounted him, and embracing his host, made his acknowledgments for the favor he had been confirmed by knighting him in terms so extraordinary that it would be in vain to attempt to repeat them. The host, in order to get rid of him the sooner, replied with no less flourish but more brevity, and without making any demand for his lodging, wished him a good journey. Chapter 4 Of What Befell Our Knight After He Had Sallied Out From The Inn What do you think so far, Vela? Just a bit of madness, maybe. <laughs> L 
light of heart, Don Quixote issued forth from the inn about break of day, so satisfied and so pleased to see himself knighted that the joy thereof almost burst his horse's girths. But recollecting the advice of his host concerning the necessary provisions for his undertaking, especially the articles of money and clean shirts, he resolved to return home and furnish himself accordingly, and also provide himself with a squire, purposing to take into his service a certain country fellow of the neighborhood, who was poor and had children, yet was very fit for the squirely office of chivalry. It certainly has my chewy sentences. <laughs> it has some very over-the-top sentences. I'll agree with that. <laughs> with this determination, he turned Rosinante toward his village, and the steed, as if aware of his master's intention, began to put on with so much alacrity that he hardly seemed to set his feet to the ground. He had not, however, gone far, when on his right hand, from a thicket hard by, he fancied he heard feeble cries as from some person complaining. And scarcely had he heard it when he said, I thank heaven for the favor it does me by offering me so early an opportunity of complying with the duty of my profession and of reaping the fruit of my honorable desires. These are, doubtless, the cries of some distressed person who stands in need of my protection and assistance. Then, turning the reins, he guided Rosinante toward the place whence he thought the cries had proceeded, and he had entered but a few paces into the woods when he saw a mare tied to an oak and a lad to another, naked from the waist upwards, about fifteen years of age, who was the person that cried out, and not without cause, for a lusty country fellow was laying on him very severely with a belt, and accompanied every lash with a reprimand and a word of advice. For, said he, the tongue slow and the eyes quick. The boy answered, I will do so no more, dear sir. By the passion of God I will never do so again, and I promise for the future to take more care of the flock. Don Quixote, observing what passed, now called out in an angry tone, Discourteous knight, it ill becomes thee to deal thus with one who is not able to defend himself. Get upon thy horse and take thy lance, for he also had a lance leaning against the oak to which the mare was fastened, and I will make thee sensible of thy dastardly conduct. The countryman, seeing such a figure coming toward him, armed from head to foot, and brandishing his lance at his face, gave himself up for a dead man, and therefore humbly answered, Senor Cavalier, this lad I am chastising is a servant of mine, whom I employ to tend a flock of sheep, which I have hereabouts. But he is so careless that I lose one every day, and because I correct him for his negligence, or roguery, he says I do it out of covetousness, and for an excuse not to pay him his wages. But before God, and on my conscience, he lies. Darst thou say so in my presence, vile rustic, said Don Quixote. By the sun that shines upon us, I have a good mind to run thee through with this lance. Pay him immediately, without further reply. Not by the God that rules us, <clears throat> or if not by the God that rules us, I will dispatch and annihilate thee in a moment. Unbind him instantly. The countryman hung down his head, and without reply, untied his boy. Don Quixote then asked the lad how much his master owed him, and he answered, nine months' wages at seven reals a month. Don Quixote, on calculation, found that it amounted to sixty-three reals, and desired the countryman instantly to disperse them, unless he meant to pay it with his life. The fellow, at, in a fright, answered that, on the word of a dying man, and upon the oath he had taken, though by the way he had taken no oath, it was not so much, for he must deduct the price of three pair of shoes he had given him on account, and a reel for two bloodlettings when he was sick. All this is very right, said Don Quixote, but set the shoes and the bloodlettings against the stripes thou hast given him unjustly. For if he tore the leather of thy shoes, thou hast torn his skin. And if the barber surgeon drew blood from him when he was sick, thou hast drawn blood from him when he is well, so that upon these accounts he owes thee nothing. The mischief is, Senor Cavalier, quoth the countryman, that I have no money about me. But let Andre go home with me, and I will pay him all, real by real. I go home with him, said the lad, the devil a bit. No, sir, I will do no such thing, for when he has me alone, he will flay me like any St. Bartholomew. He will not do so, replied Don Quixote. To keep him in awe, it is sufficient that I lay my, my commands upon him, and on condition he swears to me, by the order of knighthood which he has received, I shall let him go free, and will be bound for the payment. Good sir, think what you say, quoth the boy, for my master is no knight, nor ever received any order of knighthood. He is John Aldudo, the rich of the neighborhood of Kinitar, Quintanar. 
That is little to the purpose, answered Don Quixote. There may be knights of the family of the Aldudos, most especially as every man is the son of his own works. That's true, quoth Andres, but what works is my master the son of, who refuses me the wages of my sweat and labor? I do not refuse thee, friend Andre, replied the countryman. Have the kindness to go with me, and I swear by all the orders of knighthood that are in the world, I will pay thee every reel down, and perfumed into the bargain. For the perfuming I thank thee, said Don Quixote. Give him the reels, and I shall be satisfied, and see that thou failest not, or else by the same oath I swear to return and chastise thee. Nor shalt thou escape me, though thou wert to conceal thyself closer than a lizard. And if thou wouldst be informed <coughs> who it is that commands, that thou must feel more strictly bound to perform thy promise, know that I am the valorous Don Quixote de la Mancha, the redresser of wrongs and abuses. So farewell, and do not forget what thou hast promised and sworn, on pain of the penalty I have denounced. So saying, he clapped spurs to Rosinante, and was soon far off. The countryman, oops, pushed a button. The countryman eagerly followed him with his eyes, and when he saw him quite out of the wood, he turned to his lad Andre and said, "Come hither, child. I wish now to pay what I owe thee, as that redresser of wrongs commanded." "So you shall, I swear," quoth Andres, "and you will do well to obey the orders of that honest gentleman, whom God grant to live a thousand years, who is so brave a man and so just a judge, that e God." If you do not pay me, he will come back and do what he has threatened. And I swear so too, quoth the countryman, and to show how much I love thee, I am resolved to augment the debt that I may add to the payment. Then, taking him by the arm, he again tied him to the tree, where he gave him so many stripes that he left him for dead. Now, said he, Master Andre, call upon that redresser of wrongs. Thou wilt find he, is not, he will not easily redress this, though I believe I have not quite done with thee yet. For I have a good mind to flay thee alive, as thou saidst just now. At length, however, he untied him, and gave him leave to go in quest of his judge, to execute the threatened sentence. Andre went away in dudgeon, <clears throat> swearing he would find out the valorous Don Quixote de la Mancha, and tell him all that had passed, and that he should pay for it sevenfold. Nevertheless, he departed in tears, leaving his master laughing at him. Thus did the valorous Don Quixote redress this wrong, and elated at so fortunate and glorious a beginning to his knight errantry, he went on toward his village, entirely satisfied with himself, and saying in a low voice, Well, mayest thou deem thyself happy above all women living on the earth, O Dulcinea del Toboso, beauteous above the most beautiful, since it has been thy lot to have subject and obedient to thy whole will and pleasure, so valiant and renowned a knight, as is and ever shall be Don Quixote de la Mancha, who, as all the world knows, received but yesterday the order of knighthood, and today has redressed the greatest injury and grievance that injustice could invent and cruelty commit. Today hath he wrested the scourge out of the hand of that pity, pitiless enemy by whom a tender stripling was so undeservedly lashed. He now came to the road, which branched out in four different directions, when immediately those crossways presented themselves to his imagination, where knights errant usually stop to consider which of the roads they shall take. Here then, following their example, he paused a while, and after mature consideration let go the reins, submitting his own will to that of his horse, who, following his first motion, took the direct road toward his stable. Having proceeded about two miles, Don Quixote discovered a company of people who, as it afterwards appeared, were merchants of Toledo, going to buy silks in Mercia. There were six of them in number. They carried umbrellas and were attended by four servants on horseback and three muleteers on foot. Scarcely had Don Quixote espied them, when he imagined it must be some new adventure, and to imitate as nearly as possible what he had read in his books, as he fancied this to be cut out on purpose for him to achieve. With a graceful deportment and intrepid air, he settled himself firmly in his stirrups, grasped his lance, covered his breast with his target, and posting himself in the midst of the highway, awaited the approach of those whom he had already judged to be knights errant. And when they were come so near as to be seen and heard, he raised his voice, and with an arrogant tone cried out, Let the whole world stand, if the whole world does not confess that there is not in the whole world a damsel more beautiful 
than the Empress of La Mancha, the peerless Dulcinea del Toboso. The merchant stopped at the sound of these words, and also to behold the strange figure of him who pronounced them. And, both by the one and the other, they perceived the madness of the speaker. But they were disposed to stay and see what this confession meant, which he required. And therefore one of them, who was somewhat of a wag, but withal very discreet, said to him, Senor Cavalier, we do not know who this good lady you mentioned may be. Let us but see her, and if she be really so beautiful as you intimate, we will, with all our hearts, and without any constraint, make the confession you demand of us. Shall I show her to you, replied Don Quixote? Where would be the merit of confessing a truth so manifest? It is essential that, without seeing her, you believe, confess, affirm, swear, and maintain it. And if not, I challenge you all to battle, proud and monstrous as you are, and whether you come one by one, as the laws of chivalry require, or all together, as is the custom and wicked practice of those of your stamp, here I wait for you, confiding in the justice of my cause. Senor Cavalier, replied the merchant, I beseech your worship, in the name of all the princes here present, that we may not lay a burden upon our consciences by confessing a thing we never saw or heard, and especially being so much to the prejudice of the empress and queens of Alcaria and Esther Madura, that your worship would be pleased to show us some picture of this lady, though no bigger than a barleycorn, for we shall guess at the clue by the thread, and therewith we shall rest satisfied and safe, and your worship contented and pleased. Nay, I verily believe we are so far inclined to your side that, although her picture should represent her squinting with one eye and distilling vermilion and brimstone from the other, notwithstanding all this, to oblige you, we will say whatever you please in her favor. There distills not, base scoundrels, answered Don Quixote, burning with rage. There distills not from her what you say, but rather ambergris and civet among cotton. Neither doth she squint, nor is she hunchbacked, but as straight as a spindle of Guadarrama. But you shall pay for this horrid blasphemy you have uttered against so transcendent a beauty. So saying, with his lance couched, he ran at him who had spoken with so much fury and rage that, if good fortune had not so ordered that Rosinante stumbled and fell in the midst of his <clears throat> midst of his career, it had gone hard with the rash merchant. Rosinante fell, and his master lay rolling about the field for some time, endeavoring to rise, but in vain, so encumbered was he with his lance, target, spurs, and helmet, added to the weight of his antiquated armor. And while he was thus struggling to get up, he continued calling out, Fly not, ye dastardly rabble! Stay, ye race of slaves, for it is through my horse's fault, and not my own, that I lie here extended. A muleteer of the company, not over good natured, <clears throat> hearing the arrogant language of the poor fallen gentleman, could not bear it without returning him an answer on his ribs. And coming to him, he took the lance, which having broken to pieces, he applied one of the splinters with so much agility upon Don Quixote that, in spite of his armor, he was threshed like wheat. His masters called out, desiring him to forbear, but the lad was provoked and would not quit the game until he had quite spent the remainder of his collar, and seizing the other pieces of the lance, he completely demolished them upon the unfortunate knight, who, notwithstanding the tempest of blows that raised upon him, never shut his mouth, incessantly threatening heaven and earth and those whom to him appeared to be assassins. At length the fellow was tired and the merchants departed, sufficiently furnished with matter of discourse concerning the poor belabored knight who, when he found himself alone, again endeavored to rise. But if he could not do it when sound and well, how should he in so bruised and battered a condition? Yet he was consoled in looking upon this as a misfortune peculiar to knight's errant, and imputing the blame to his horse, although to raise himself up was impossible, his whole body was so horribly bruised. And that's where we will stop for today. We'll pick this up tomorrow with chapter five. But yeah, we're ending with Don Quixote getting his butt kicked. And I'll see about maybe taking some pictures of the images and posting them in the Discord or something if you guys would like that. But let me know what you thought of it post in the uh, discord and uh, yeah, I will see everyone tomorrow
Have an excellent morning, evening, afternoon, night, midday, midnight, whatever it happens to be, wherever you are. All right.